in the University of Vermont, um, the guy, what's the guy's name? Yeah, uh, Costan Bob Costanzas, you know, did do a paper called The Value of Ecosystem Resources and attempted to put a price tag globally on the value of those resources just to create some context to how overwhelming that value is relative to the value that, that we create from those resources. So if you haven't read that, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. The, the problem that I have is that at the end of the day, everything is made up. Nobody can really answer it with any certainty. And um, so, there's a, so there is a leap of faith there of saying it, it's immense. And as the Colonel said, a lot of things are not known. We don't know what's there. So how do we put a value on what we don't know is there? So my uh, question is inspired by the juxtaposition of two things. One, Jeff, was your reference to systems thinking and also being open to very challenging questions. And the last is that the last time I was in this room was to hear the sex and relationship therapist Esther Farrell talk. So in that context, it was interesting when she would present a number of cases, there would appear to be someone with a problem and someone with a solution. But oftentimes there is a codependent relationship there. And it occurs to us that there may be some ways in which we do the same thing. Um, I know that I'm not even sure I can call myself a convert to sustainability. I'm, I'm interested in it. But it occurs to me there have been times I've heard lectures given by people like you guys and walked out of the room feeling really good, maybe changed the light bulb, and that was about it. So I'm wondering in that context, what are the things that you've discovered actually have just kind of fed the system they're enabling? And so that you know maybe there are some of us that aren't far enough along in that, and you can help us be alert to that sooner. And then secondly, what are some of the things that you feel are actually changing the system in a fundamental way? You know, th that's a great question because if, if I had hours to talk, I would say, one of the things that I would say is that most of what is wrong with the world from my perspective starts with what's already inside of me. And um, um, it, is, it is sometimes disheartening to see how much of what we look outside and say, well, this company shouldn't do this and this person shouldn't do that is a, 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 a very, very uh, ingrained part of how I live my life. Uh, and, and I'll tell you one story relative to that. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, challenged me to go 30 days without buying anything new other than food and maybe gasoline. And I said, you know, that's, I really want to do that. I want to go 30 days and not buy something new. And I said, as soon as, the new Mac Air comes out and I buy that, then I'll start my 30 days. And, you know, then it was, well, but I, I, I also want that iPhone. So, you know, that's going to be coming out in 60 days. And, and it, is, it is amazing and, and actually quite scary to see how much of our own identity and how much of, of ourselves is defined by what we buy and what we accumulate. And uh, uh, I find, uh, and, and the book I wrote before this one, which is called In Our Every Deliberation, talks a lot about the patterns that become part of who we are and how critical it is to become conscious of those patterns that perpetuate the, the unintended consequences of our own behavior because the system we don't like is not out there. <laughs> it starts right here. We can take only one quick question for two minutes. Uh, hi, um, I want to thank you all for sharing your experiences and your insights. Um, I have a question about the economic logic of this and uh, as Jeffrey pointed out how it's a struggle to remain an independent business. I've noticed a trend with companies like Silk Soy Milk, the makers of Silk Soy Milk, I believe they were bought out by a larger company. I noticed that the word organic dropped from the label and now it's natural. Uh, is there an inevitable drive toward consolidation and you know, these things, these innovators, the people who have a passion, sooner or later they sell the business and then it goes away, it becomes something else. 
So is it really sustainable? Uh, that's, that's really the question. What's the economic logic behind this? Is it sustainable? The, the, the single biggest challenge that I think these businesses face, because Silk and Horizon were bought by Dean Foods, which is the biggest dairy company, I think, in the United States. When I, when I, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about why this happens, and I think it has more to do with capital formation and the ownership structure of these companies. And I, I often say that it's more important who you take money from than who you hire, because if you make a mistake when you hire someone, you can fire them. When you take someone's money, particularly when you take someone's money and you put them on your board, they have a, uh, even though they might own a little percent of your business, they can have a very loud voice. And what I find is that the capital that comes into many of these companies is not aligned with the values and the mission and the long-term purpose of the company. So, for example, if we had taken venture capital money, we would have been sold 10 years ago because the venture capital fund was seven years and they were two years into it so that they had to create liquidity at the end of five years, which means that three years after they make the investment, they're figuring out what their exit is. And the deals they make are ugly. I mean, you know, many of these venture private equity firms, and I won't say that they're all bad, but I'll say that the vast majority of them are, uh, we, we just went out to raise 25 million bucks and we got term sheets from some of these private equity companies and they want to give you, you know, $10 million. Three years from now, you give $20 million back to them so they rent you the money um, and they own 5% of your company and if you can't pay them, they have the right to sell the company in order to get their money out. And I mean, these are deals that are designed to facilitate disaster. And yet, because there is a shortage of capital that is aligned with these values, despite the fact that many of these funds say, oh yes, we believe in socially responsible business, as long as it takes place over the next three years, we can double our money and you do whatever we tell you to do. Uh, so anyway, sorry, cynical response. <laughs> um, I just want to just support what Jeff said. I mean, I sold my company two years ago, and the biggest problem I had was with the capital formation and how to sell it. And I took my senior management team, and I put them through the whole process with me so that they would see and understand. And the venture capitalists, oh, the same, the same thing. They were just going to turn around and flip it in a few years. And as the senior management team began to understand how limited the options were, we came up together with one firm that we all felt would be good for the future of the company and for a lot to allow it to continue to operate with the values that it had. It was extremely difficult, extremely. So I don't own a business, and I'm, that's a, it would be nice to say, you know, I sold my business, but, but I've seen <laughs> cases, and one, one, one issue that we follow very closely is the microfinancial industry in, in, in all of our regions, and that's a big problem, not only out of value, but out of strategy, because once a big bank used to kind of regular, you know, banking services acquire a microfinancial institution, what happens is that the systems just don't fit. They're, they're, they have intrinsically different strategies, at least in my opinion. Um, and one ca in one interesting case, there was a chief kind of, it wasn't the word value officer, but it was, I don't remember what the, word, the, the, the term was, but there was a vice president who was also a member of the board, by the way, who who kind of took care of the institution's values within, because it had to be, you know, had to, so that it, it, it's hard, but the, so they can, it cannot, it doesn't take money from institutions or investors who would lead them astray, let's say. So it, it, was, it was an interesting solution, uh, but it's what I think points is to the, to the theme of this meeting, right? In the end, values have to be involved in the management of firms, and in the end, values belong to human beings, I think. And, and so firms are these abstractions, really. It's people within them, and the decisions, the very courageous decisions that you two made on not taking money or on taking money but making sure that it wouldn't affect your values or the values you would give found in the company. So uh, that points to personal values, right? And who are the entrepreneurs and who are the people? So it's not to let them kind of go into the vortex of VC or whatever other company, but it's 